Hey, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's Danny Brown with The Deal. Today's episode is Josh Booty. Josh is a Louisiana sports legend at LSU. He was the high school player of the year, both in baseball and football. He originally got to be a first round draft pick by the Marlins, played, made it to the big leagues, and then decided he missed football and rolled back in LSU. Had a couple huge years there, got drafted in the NFL, played three or four years in the NFL, and now it's uh, we get into life after football. He's an entrepreneur. He's got his hands in a lot of startups. Uh, he's got a lot of different industries. He's doing a lot of business development. A fantastic guy, a lot of fun. Uh, we've had a lot of laughs through the years. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I have. Uh, you can always find Josh at Josh Booty 10 on Instagram and find out what he's doing. He's got a podcast, QB, SEC QB. It's a huge podcast about being a quarterback in the SEC and reviewing all the SEC games. So great, great guy, has a broad, broad spectrum of uh, interest and talents and you know, really, really a cool guy. So enjoy it. Thank you for following us. Please give us a five-star review on Apple. Uh, tell your friends about it, pass it on. We appreciate you listening. See you soon. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Deal with Danny Brown. Today, I have a special guest, Josh Booty. What's going on, Josh? How are you? I'm doing great, man. I appreciate you having me on the show, and I've, I've been looking forward to this all week since I knew we were going to do this, so this is fun for me. Yeah, I even put a picture of your boy, Millar, behind me in my <laughs> office, just so you feel at home, because, you know, I want you to be comfortable. I, I, you know, Millar makes you very calm and comfortable. Yeah, uh -huh. he actually uh, he actually doesn't make me calm, but that looks like, I've seen that picture before, I think that was a pop-up to the second baseman. <laughs> <laughs> he told me that was, a, that was a bomb to the upper deck, but who knows, you're probably that was right. <laughs> opposite field bomb? No, I don't think so. I think that was one of yeah. his pop-ups. <laughs> He got jammed. Well, look, Josh Booty, you're a Louisiana sports legend, uh, high school superstar, baseball, football. We're going to get into that later. But first, you know, I want to get into what's going on now. You're living in Florida. I know you're a, a major entrepreneur. You've had your hands in a lot of startup businesses. Uh, I'd love to hear a little about what you're focusing on now, what businesses you're, you're, you got your hands in and what's coming up for you. Thanks, man. I appreciate you asking. I have a consulting and marketing company called Big Dreams Ventures that I own and operate myself. I've gotten into five or 10 businesses in the last five or 10 years. Once I got done playing, I really didn't know what to do with myself. And my dad had always told me, keep up with everybody you ever meet because you never know who you're going to want to network with and uh, in life long term and in business uh, once you're done playing. And that's exactly what I did. I wanted to try to network and meet people and try to put deals together. So uh, I ended up raising money for some startup companies that that have done well in in in, in oil and gas and healthcare and uh, food distribution spaces, gaming, uh, and a lot of different things. I'm a part of an AI company with my brother Jack, my youngest brother here in uh, Fort Lauderdale. We're about to open the doors early November, and that's going to be fun. It's a text message based marketing platform that we we put together with some guys from Toronto and and Southern California. So we're all coming here to do that. Um, I'm also a part of a company called SC Health, which is a healthcare company based on the PPE space and everything that we've been dealing with in the COVID space, which has been fun okay. and government deals and retail deals and hospital deals where we've helped provide uh, products and services to them. And then I, 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 like, like I said, I've kind of been all over the place in different things, have my, my podcast that I do every week, the SEC quarterback podcast. It's uh, on the Believe Podcast Network, which is- What is that called, SEC? Say SCP that again. TV. Yeah, podcast. Right. The Believe Podcast Network, and it's spelled B L E A V. It's a big podcast network uh, out of L.A. Uh, one of my best friends owns it and runs it. He was uh, he was um, uh, roommates with uh, Matt Leinart at USC and and was a pro. Fight on, baby. Fight on, baby. <laughs> and uh, I'm so trying Tom, to get Leinart on. He said he was coming <laughs> on, but I, I'm trying to yeah. trying to get him on here now. No, he would be a good one, man. He's doing a good job on Fox. And anyways, yeah, so doing all kinds of stuff, but having fun doing it. And, uh, you know, of course, wish I was still playing. You see guys like Breeze and Brady and Roethlisberger still playing at a high level is pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So you're thinking you need to get in shape and suit up one more season? <laughs> I wish. I wish. Hey, l l let me just stop right there. You said your brother Jack's there. You mean Jack, a.k.a. John David? 
No, uh, see, I've got okay. three brothers, so yeah. I didn't know there was another brother. Yeah. Not like yeah, John, I, Jack? Yeah, there's four of us. Um, Abram played with me at LSU, JD played at USC, and then my youngest brother, Jack, he got into business right out of high school. He was a good player, but didn't want to go the college route to do to play sports, and I wanted to get in business, and we, we've done two or three things together already, so we, we have a lot of fun, and we're actually – uh, in the same condo here in, in Fort Lauderdale. So it's, it's been a lot of fun awesome. to spend some time with him. Okay. Awesome. That's the one brother I haven't, I haven't met and didn't know about That's a younger brother. So here's an interesting thought. You're an entrepreneur. You're the youngest hands one, are in so he, he's 30. Yeah. So you have your hands in several, you have your hands in several businesses. So what is it like in terms of focus and pivoting from thing to thing to thing, because it's a lot of different verticals. It's a lot of different types of businesses. I imagine you're wearing a lot of hats, or maybe you're wearing the same hat, but in a lot of different spaces where you have to you have to shift. Tell me a little bit how you handle that when you got 10 companies you're working on. Well, uh, to be honest with you, I handle it in this notepad <laughs> every <laughs> day, all day. I, you know, my schedule is, is always different, which is, I love, it's amazing. Um, I, I just decided, you know, when I got out of sports, I didn't want to work behind a desk. I didn't want to work for the Merrill Lynch's or the corporate companies of the world. I wanted to really do my own thing and see if I could see if I could put some un unbelievable things together. And so I kind of went on my way. You know, not a lot of people like to kind of dive in like that, but I did. And I said, man, I'm just going to try to make it work and make it happen and see if I can build some some awesome things. And I, I just I don't know. I've got real lofty goals and um I work hard every day on different on different things, and I, I tell you, it is very hard to stay organized. But at the same time, um, you know, I I a lot of the people that I deal with are buddies of mine and people that I know well, and and um, I do play the same role within every company that I work with or work for and and consult for and and have equity with. So I, you know, it's it's the same opening doors, um, building relationships, and that's the that's yeah. the fun part of business for me. Everybody's different. You got to have a you know, you got to have your lead off hitter, your, your, you got to have your cleanup hitter. You got to have your, you know, your pitcher and your catcher in the defense. And I, I just like playing my role. I like networking. Right. I like uh, putting people together and building companies. Yeah. So you're a business dev sales guy, relationship guy, which is really the core to, to building every business. Uh, I like to say, you know, how does that tie into uh, the work ethic and balancing uh, schedule. I mean, from your sports days, did, did a lot of that time management and focus and endurance, do you think it comes from, you know, a life of, of sports, your first, you know, 30 years of your life? Oh, for sure. I think, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, baseball, baseball taught me a lot at an early age. When I came out of high school, of course, played professional baseball with the Marlins and you had to grow up fast. You're on the road, you play night games every night and you, you're in a different city. I love to travel. And that's probably because I traveled a lot when I was early and got used to it. But yeah. you know, it's like, there's no, there's no off days. There's no, there's no time off. It's like, you know, a lot of my calls I do 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night. I was on the phone yeah. last night at midnight with guys in Dubai, you know, we're trying to put a yeah. tech company together, uh, an app together with some guys in Dubai. So it's around the clock with, with the PPE stuff. It's with China and Malaysia and different companies where you've got to get some of your products from and you're trying to help people. So, I mean, I think it just, you know, the baseball and the football, both, uh, it's just constant competitive uh, environments right. and, and I'm on my own doing it. So, you know, I've, I've partnered with great people, but I've, I've got to do a lot on my own and that's, that's the fun part of business. Sure. Well, well, we wait to hear how these things turn out. I'm, you know, as business like like baseball or sports, it's a numbers game, and you know, sometimes you pursue pursue ten things, and you know, one or two or three blow up, and that's that is fantastic, and hopefully that grind pays off. So let me now get back into uh, some personal stuff. The life of Josh Booty. This has mainly been so far a L.A., California, New York. Uh, audience. So many of the audience people may not know your past history. So I want to just set it up and say, look, you're a Shreveport, Louisiana native. Uh, you came from a sports family. Your dad was a, was a superstar athlete, uh, but you were truly a, a legendary athlete uh, growing up. So why don't we start with how sports was introduced to you as a little kid, how it, how it impacted you, and sort of your, your stages of 
youth sports and then getting into high school when you sure. really became a, you know, a national known athlete? Yeah, my, my dad, he played college football. My mom was a college cheerleader. So they were both athletic people. Perfect. But, you know, they thought about, uh, you know, sports growing up. That's all they, you know, in, in Shreveport, Louisiana, there's just not a lot to do other than play sports or, you know, I guess work for your, in the family business or, um, I lived in a, yeah, fishing, hunting. I mean, sportsman's <laughs> paradise. I mean, that's what people do. And it's, it's whatever season it is, that's what they're involved in. It's like football, baseball, basketball, you know, and tracks big down there too. And, you know, they, they, a lot of speed comes out of Louisiana when you think about, you know, football and, and uh, the NFL draft and different things. And of course, yeah. LSU football, but I, that's, I grew up, that's all I thought about was sports. And, and uh, I was a baseball player first and foremost. I love little league. My dad was a traveling uh, slow pitch softball player, but at a pretty yeah. high level. So I would always travel with the team. I mean, nice. I was a bat boy on the team. Um, we, there was even other kids on the team that became superstar. Vernon Wells, uh, his, his <laughs> dad was playing softball with my dad growing up. So we were bat boys together. And it's like, so we grew up nice. a little different at the ballpark every day, every yeah. night almost. And then on the weekends, all weekend. And, and uh, I really fell in love with baseball and, uh, but my dad was a college football player. So, um, you know, there's just not organized football. At, you know, once you're done, you know, playing college or pro, there's really no organized football. So he got into slow pitch softball and I fell in love with baseball. I'd shag yeah. ball. I would, I'd want to be at every game cry if he didn't take me on, the, you know, late night games on the weekdays <laughs> when I had school. And that just was the way that I, you know, I just fell in love with sports, man. And uh, couldn't wait to get, you know, if it rained, I cried, you know, we, games got delayed or, or rained out, you know, just, Nowadays, kids are playing 80 games in the summer and travel ball. Right. We used to play 15 or 20. So if you got right. one or two rained out, man, it ruins your whole summer, you know. So, right. I, you know, that was just me. And then my dad took a, a coaching job to help uh, to help develop and start the high school that I went to. And him and another guy uh, pretty much from the ground up started Evangel Christian Academy. And I ended up going to school there uh, the first year that it opened. I was in eighth grade. And then – uh, they built the football program. They built the stadium. My freshman year oh, was wow. the first year that they were in c competitive, uh, you know, district play and could go to the playoffs and all that. And I started as a freshman. They told me if you come out and play quarterback, we'll let you throw the ball around every down. And and uh, I did, man. And I, you know, I ran for my life when I was young. But we got better and better <laughs> and better. And I uh, ended up winning, you know, championships and which was fun and breaking national records. And you know, I sped through that, but. Um, my dad and another guy named Denny Duran there at Evangel Christian, who's still the head football coach and uh, running the program. They started that school and they ended up winning a national championship. And they're always, wow. you know, USA Today, top 25 for 15, 20 years. They were they've done some amazing things. So this is in Shreveport? In this Shreveport. is in your hometown. So was your dad an educator? Like what? That's a huge undertaking to try to launch a school. What was the impetus? Was there a lack of schooling? Was there not good pride? Like tell me where how, that's I, a lot to take on. Yeah, I think the private school uh, situation in our, my hometown wasn't great. There was a big Catholic school. I say big, medium sized Catholic school it was really the only significant private school in the area. And uh, so they started just a Christian academy based on really from scratch. From scratch, I mean the, the church found the yeah. found the, the area, found the land, found the building. Yeah, it was wow. based on it was based on a church, on a community church, and okay. so they used a lot of that background for its uh, beginnings. Um, you know, the first year was a lot of kids from the church that were in you know, middle school and elementary, they ended up coming up, coming over to Evangel because it was K-5 through 12. And, um, you know, they there was probably 20, you know, 15, 20 people in every class. It wasn't very big. Okay, tiny. tiny. Real tiny. Yeah, real, real tiny. It still is tiny. There's probably only 100 people in, the, in each class still. But right. it's always been tiny. But they built a, a real football program, and then people started coming. And, I mean, we Got played it. in front of crowds of – 40, 50,000 people. I mean, crazy football crowds. Yeah. But, you know, we went from, you know, my dad and then went from really not having 25 kids on the team the first year to, to winning a national championship in, you know, in 10 years, which was pretty amazing. But they had a lot of good guys around, a lot of good football coaches. Uh, a lot of NFL guys would come through. Shreveport's known for football. Terry Bradshaw, 
Um, my dad graduated from the same high school, got coached by the same guys. I mean, it's wow. just a yeah. real big time football environment there. And uh, yeah. they tried to duplicate a lot of that and bring it all into a Christian environment. And it just skyrocketed. And the next thing you know, they were, you know, winning titles every year, which was pretty cool. That's incredible. That is an incredible experience. So you are a new student, your dad's running the school, and you, as a freshman and a you know young guy, you became a, a, the star young player. Uh, for those of you that don't know, but you became the national player of the year. Uh, were you player of the year both in baseball and football? Or I was, was it just in several publications. I mean, like the USA Today, I was first team, you know, super prep or whatever, the, the USA Today first team All-American, and I was MVP of the football, but I wasn't of the baseball. So – but yeah. in the I think Gatorade, I was baseball or Sporting News, I was yeah. baseball, but not in the USA Today, and that was the the most significant I think of all of them. Um, you know, I graduated same year as Peyton Manning out of high school, and he won Gatorade Football Player of the Year, and I won USA Today Football Player of the Year. So you right. know, there's several so you publications. It just depends on who you're, you know, who you who you like looking at. Yeah, but that gives everyone an idea. It was you and Peyton were the players, the quarterbacks of the year. So that said, this is the next transition. So coming out of high school, obviously you were recruited highly in both sports, but you became a first-round draft pick for baseball, fifth pick by the Marlins, right? Yep. yep. And um, uh, and you had to make a decision. So I'm sure as a high school senior, I'm really curious, can you take, walk us through the mindset of you and your family at that age trying to decide, hey, look, I have two great opportunities here. What what made you uh, lean towards uh, the cash money? Was it the cash money? <laughs> I mean, I grew up a coach's kid. I mean, I when, and I loved baseball too. So I, I love both sports. Football was probably more fun at the end of my high school experience because, you know, Friday night lights, just a lot more people come to games yeah. and hear about it. And then, it's you like know, a cultural experience, so big, a cultural deal. And uh, high yeah. school baseball is just not the same, even though right. it's, it was Neat. so much fun. Um, you know, I signed with LSU to play football and baseball. And the reason I wanted to go to LSU was there, they were national champions the year before in baseball in the College World Series. Yeah. And Skip Bertman was there, amazing program. Um, Is that Todd Walker, dear? Todd Walker was in my yeah. draft. And I grew up with right. Todd, actually. I, I Shout actually, out to Todd I, Walker. We've got to get him on, too. Yeah, he's on Red Sox. I, I saw him last <laughs> yeah. week at the Louisiana Hall of Fame sports golf tournament. Oh, uh, that's right. That's right. I actually dated his sister in high school, but he, uh, he great guy, great family. His brother, Mark played football at LSU when I went back, but long story short, I guess I, I, uh, when I got drafted, I, I had to make the decision to go to LSU and play both or sign a pro contract. And, yeah. and my, my agent at the time, Jeff Morad, wonderful guy, a uh, big time sports agent, a part of right. Lee, Lee Steinberg and Morad. Yeah. Yep. They represented everybody. I'm Steve Young, Drew Bledsoe, Warren Moon, Troy Aikman. I mean, yeah. Manny Ramirez, Will, Will Clark. I mean, all these guys growing up that were the biggest names in sports. And sure. so I, I wanted him to represent me. And, and I, he actually represented Todd the same year we came out of, of the draft the same year. So okay. Todd, Todd and them had won the national championship at LSU. And I was going to kind of replace him and, and uh, you know, as an infielder on the LSU team and play football too. Well, when I got drafted fifth overall, Morad had me positioned to go to the Marlins because they were a new franchise. Wayne Huizenga had a bunch of money. And, yeah. you know, they, they didn't have a lot of prospects in their farm system. And he said, we'll, we'll get you up in, you know, up through the system fast and you'll quick. make it quick. And I, so I'm yeah. like, man, I can't pass this up. It was a, I love South Florida. Who doesn't, uh, you yeah. know, and then Wayne Huizenga is a wealthy owner. They don't have a yeah. big time. Um, uh, a minor league system going yet and I can flow through that uh, quickly yeah. and then I got a record signing bonus so I'm like I'm I, I gotta go do this yeah. I, I couldn't I couldn't not do it right no brainer sort of a once in a lifetime opportunity and you got to go for it so you sign you sign for big money uh, young kid obviously that's life-changing then you go to the minors for the minor league grind doesn't matter how much money you sign for you're going to where was your first where was your rookie league what kind of town were you in I uh grinding. I Elmira New York in the New York Penn League and it's a college league so I was coming out of high school never hit with a wood bat before I'm facing you know guys that that uh you know pitched three, four years in college or had been in the minor leagues for a year or so. So it was very difficult at the beginning because I just didn't really know how to hit with the wood. I mean, nowadays these kids, like I said, they play so many games in the summer. 
perfect game guys. They play with a wood bat since they're 15. We didn't do that. And so, you know, it's, it was very difficult the first year or so just because I was learning how to hit it really good pitching for the first time. And then, you know, I went from Elmira to, to, to a ball to, I mean, to King County, which is regular a ball. Then I'm, you know, Portland, Maine, double a, and I'm I, every year I went up a level um, really quick and, and, you know, the minor, these guys can really play even at double a. I mean, these guys understand what they're doing and it's every day. And, um, you know, that was, that was a difficult part in the beginning. I, I, I started doing better at the end hitting uh, or better kind of after a year or so, but defensively, I felt like I could play in the big leagues from day one. And, uh, you know, guys like Jim Leland, who were as a manager of the Marlins at the time were like, you know, you can play for me because you can play defense and then what you're hitting will come, you know. So I just I kept kind of going at it with that mindset is is, uh, you know, as, as an 18 year old kid is let's just play great defense and the hitting will come. And it usually does for a lot of players like that. Yeah. So you get the it's a major jump going from high school to college league where guys are coming out of LSU and Texas and USC and UCLA and, you know, which is basically already like a double A and minor. So yeah, what a major shift in terms of hitting and facing pitching every day and wood bats and all that. So you, you grind through the minor leagues, you end up getting called up a couple of years, how, how many years in three, four five years in? Yeah. I, my, Pretty my, quick. Sec- my second year, I got called up, but I only got five at bats. And then yeah. my third year, I, got, I I went back and played double A at the end of, I mean, at the beginning of 97. So I played double A all year and we, w- we went to the double A championship and we had great players. Millar was our first baseman, Kotze, Randy oh. Wynn, Todd Sednick, Alex Gonzalez, Louis Castillo. We had a, I what mean, a team. Yeah. Everybody went to the big leagues the next year. And um, yeah. You know, I was on that team and then got called up in 97, and that was when the Marlins won the World Series, and I was there with right. them, uh, you know, through the postseason. And Incredible they brought me experience. up into season for uh, for Bobby Bonilla, who was hurt. And um, I got a few at-bats, and then in the postseason, he was fine, and I just sat there on the bench, but it was a fun yeah. ride, of course. And then 98, I started opening day for the Marlins and then uh, got injured got sent to triple a the end of 98 when i got healthy didn't play well the last month of the season i had i had uh, messed up my thumb really bad and and so in 99 they were going to start me out in triple a again and that's when hazinga sold the team to john henry who now wow. owns the red sox but henry would let me out of my no football clause of my contract and that's how i ended up at lsu i wanted to go back and play football if i i said either i'm gonna go Triple either big leagues or college football, and when they said you're going to go start in Triple A, I said I'm going to go play college football, and I wanted to try it out and see what I could do, and and uh, that's what I did. So that's a good transition. So were was football on your mind uh, for those four or five years in the, in baseball, or was it more something that as when the injury happened and you're in Triple A, you're like I don't want to go through this. What was tell me how that all developed and how you made that decision because here you are, a young player. On a you know at big league level going down to AAA, but you're clearly right there, uh, you know that you to walk away from that to go back to start football. Tell me how how you came up uh, on that decision. I just really missed it bad, and and my brother Abram was an All SEC receiver at LSU, and you know the opportunity to play with him. Uh, they didn't have a quarterback coming back on their roster. Um, I just wanted to go do it. And like every time when I, every, every year in the off season, when I went home, it was all football. My dad was a coach, my brothers <laughs> played, you know, I'd go to tiger stadium and watch my brother, uh, in 1997, they, they beat number one Florida and it was unbelievable. And my brother, you know, he had a hundred and something yards receiving that day against Spurrier and then when they were number one. And, wow. and so I was like, man, I just want to go back and play football. It just looked so much more appealing to me. Uh, and so it was a heart, it was a heart thing. I think I just wanted to do it. I'm like, I'm gonna go with my heart, and I'm gonna go back and play a year. My goal was to always try to do both at the same time. You know, like I don't know, like be on both. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, to be a quarterback and do it is just it's almost impossible because you have to be there year round. You can't just show yeah. up and helicopter in like Dion did but right. um, you just got to be a part of the system. You got to know exactly what's going on, and so. You know that didn't happen. I went back and played football at, at LSU, and and it was like uh, 
probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do because I, I wasn't going back to sit on the bench. You know, I wanted to start yeah. and uh, I wanted to make the NFL. I wanted to get drafted. So I went, I went back to LSU to, to get really serious about it. And uh, we had a really tough first year with Jerry DiNardo as the head coach. We went like okay. four and seven. We didn't have any success uh, offensively. Uh, we couldn't run the ball, had some real injuries on the offensive line. My brother got hurt at receiver. Another kid got kicked off the team at receiver, and we just didn't have any depth. And then that's when uh, now president of the NCAA, Mark Emmert, was the chancellor at LSU. He hired Nick Saban, and that really changed everything at LSU was Saban coming in, hiring great a great staff, and then coaching us up. And, and I took advantage of that as much as I could. So that had to be an incredible life experience playing under Saban. So here you are, you're more mature. You're a couple of years older than, than most guys you've been out. How long did it take you to feel that you were in the zone and get your rhythm back as a quarterback? Uh, was it immediately? Did it take a year? Like, what, what did you think? It, it, took like? a good, it took a good year. I mean, I could throw every route, um, but football is not about, you know, throwing every route. I mean, it's nice to be able to do that. It's just, there's so much more to it. Um, we were LSU was always a run first team. I was always under center, eye backfield, two tight ends. Like I grew up in the spread, uh, four or five wide receivers, yeah. shotgun, slinging it around, nonstop. Like go, 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 go. Like you, you know, you see some of these teams Today. now, you know, yeah. and and it was just LSU wasn't there yet. So I had to really go back and learn, you know, the run game and all this stuff that I didn't really care about. So it was tough just because. I wasn't getting to showcase what I think I can do best, and that's throwing the football all over the place. And and so that was very difficult in the beginning. When Saban got there, he started implement, uh, implementing a little more balance because he hired Jimbo Fisher, and Jimbo Fisher liked three receiver sets, which was not even like what they do now with four and five yeah. wide receivers, but three receiver sets was a plus for me because we, we didn't get in three receiver sets my first year, and so right. I liked it a lot better. Right. So, okay. So this is really interesting. Saban, Jumbo Fisher. I mean, these are legendary coaches, legendary leaders of men, uh, influencers. Anything that stands out to you as things that you've learned from them, things that have stood out that you've taken with you, nuggets that you can share with us? Because, I mean, these guys are, you know, some of the best that, to ever do it. They are, man. They're hard nosed, they're detailed. Everybody always talks about how detailed Saban is, but he really does get to a whole nother level. And, you know, it's just putting the hours in, but it's it's quality hours. It's not, you know, it's quantity and quality. It's it's crazy <laughs> because he doesn't really he doesn't require sleep, and he'll tell you that I need three or four hours of sleep a night, and I, so I'm getting <laughs> yeah. I'm getting eighteen twenty hours in when everybody else is getting you know ten or twelve, and he says so I'm going to beat everybody's ass that way because it, they're, they're, no one can put in as much as I can. So he has that pro mentality, you know, in college and. A lot of those college coaches don't put in as much work as the NFL coaches do. And I think because he was at the NFL level and came down and he's military and his thinking, I think yeah. he just he, he just absolutely pushes everybody, you know, in the building. And it's it, whether it's, you know, his, him and his staff recruiting or he coaches his, his coaches as hard as he does his players, even on the field. So he would he would rip Jimbo Fisher like he would rip us. And Jimbo was a young <laughs> offensive coordinator at the time. And I think everybody in the building is just kind of, you know, scared of him to a certain degree. Um, you know, he was he a little was fear. Fiery. Yeah. He's uh he is a commander in chief and um, that's what's made him so good, man. He works nonstop. He knows what he's doing though and, and how he can apply that work in special ways and recruiting is a lot of it at the college level. Yeah, I can't imagine. How, how does that guy not sleep? How do you have any energy if you sleep two or three hours a night? Is he downing espressos all day? <laughs> <laughs> they would do uh, five-hour energies, you know, right when it first came out. They were always drinking coffee. Jimbo loved coffee, but yeah. Saban's the same way. I mean, they just – they're just they're working. Wired. You know, you got guys yeah. that, that are – you know, you got – you know, people in life. It's like you got workaholics, you got – you got people who kind of lazy, you know, they're like extreme workaholics, extreme just, workaholics, <laughs> extreme workaholics, man. And they love what they do. And they, they just, they can't, they hate losing. 
it was it would be super competitive in a practice because Saban ran the defense. Jimbo, of course, ran the offense, and and they were, they were both going at it. You know, even talking trash to one another during the two minute drills and stuff like that. Or you can't do that. Or you know, yeah. you know, slapping each other around a little bit. They were both young coaches, and they just wanted it really bad. And that's what we all saw. And you feed off of that, right? So, yeah, incredible. That's a true true lesson in needing to be competitive needing to be uh, you know, energized, wanting to give whatever it takes to win. I mean, those guys are the epitome of not wanting to lose and just being so committed to winning that they'll work and work and work and won't sleep. Of course, I get it. If anyone's like that, they must love what you do because you can't be up all day and night if you're not in love with what you do. You just, you, even if you're a naturally wired person, you're gonna run out of gas, but obviously they love it. What an incredible, place to be. I, I, I didn't even remember that J Jimbo Fisher was there too. And these are two guys that are at the highest level of coaching of all time. And yeah. wow. And wow. And also at a time where coaching with that military style has been a little frowned upon. And a lot of the kids have grown up so soft and entitled in these club leagues that when they get to that college or pro level, they're not used to that. And they don't, they don't necessarily want that. They want a nice, touchy-feely coach, you know. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's not, really it's interesting not, to hear that. It's not the country club environment, I can tell you that. No, and, no. You know, that's, that's a, they want to get the hard-nosed kid that will stick their neck in there. They're going to work hard and, uh, you know, do the right thing, too. I mean, discipline is a big part of what they preach. And, you know, as, I, I just, as I'm talking to you, I think about all these stories. But discipline – it's such a key to success uh, in everything you do in balance. But like, you know, in offense, it's like you, you have to have balance to win. You, you can't. And in life, you have to be balanced as a person, as a human being. But yeah. like you've got to have a run game. you got to have you got to be able to throw if you're down. You know what I'm saying? So you've got to have all these little pieces in place. And they and they're so calculated in how they think. And not a lot of guys will take the time to really think through every little thing that they got to think through. I, I remember two years ago, I was driving from Atlanta to Destin, Florida, going on a little vacation with some buddies and we passed through Tuscaloosa and I called up there to Saban's office and I said, and this is just in the off season, the summer. And, and I said, is coach around? I, I'm going to come through. I'd love to say hello for five minutes. I know, you know, he's the busiest guy in Alabama, but right. uh, the, the, the secretary who was at LSU with, with us answered the phone. She goes, Hey Josh, she Save. goes, I wish, yeah, this is Saban, Saban's secretary. And she said, I wish he was here to see you, but um, he's going to be in, he's in five states this morning uh, on his, on the plane recruiting. So he was like, you know, off it's, you know, in five different states that morning. And, and so he gets up at five o'clock and he'll fly, 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 fly like Donald Trump, you know, he's somewhere different yeah. every day. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing how much he puts into, uh, into uh, football. Yeah, that's that. When you think about work ethic and drive, and you think about, uh, you can always take it to another level. When you know there's guys like Saban, you be like, whoa, there's a few levels I could get to in terms of work, work ethic and detail. And you know, you made some really interesting points about balance in sports. It's the same as balance in life. Yeah, all these things apply, and that's it's it's so interesting when I talk to past athletes like you and other guys. That, you know, so much of those lessons. That's what makes you a successful person in anything you do. It's the discipline, you know, the discipline alone. That's it. If you know, you're either disciplined or you're not. And if you're disciplined, you're going to start achieving things that you want to do. And if you're exactly. not disciplined, you're not. You're not going to be able to achieve anything. That's just the way it is. So finish out your college story. So you've had some success. You turned LSU around. You you know, you be, you had some really good uh, numbers in LSU. You guys won a big bowl game. Then here you go, your senior year at LSU, and it's the NFL draft. Tell me about, uh, you know, the end of that college experience and then going to the NFL. Yeah, I, uh, I was a little older, of course, because I played pro baseball and – I just felt like I needed to go try my luck in the NFL and see where I could get drafted and, you know, go to the combine. And I was all SEC, so it gave me a little bit of uh, of an advantage on, like, getting, you know, invited to the combine and, and all sure. that. And, and people knew a lot about, uh, I guess, my past successes in high school. And, and uh, you know, it's both years I was at LSU, I started, so that was very good. Um, and I was 25 years old, to be honest with you. It was time for me to go 26 at that that time. And I was like, I don't want to come back to college in another year. I want to go to the NFL. And yeah. so I went and 
and went back and signed a deal with Steinberg and Morad again, and they represented me on the football side this time instead of baseball, and uh, went to the combine. Thought I did well, but uh, it wasn't drafted high. I was drafted in the sixth round by the Seahawks, Mike Holmgren, and uh, yeah. was roommates with Hasselback in camp, his first year there in Seattle. Uh, Dilfer was there too, and we had a blast, yeah. man. But I ended up getting traded to Cleveland that the first year, uh, and I right. backed up Tim Couch for a while there, three years with Butch Davis. But I was in Seattle for camp, and and uh, you know from the draft to, up until the season. Yeah, yeah, and so you ended up in Cleveland. And how many years did you stay in the NFL? I was there in Cleveland for three years, and um, yeah, and Butch Davis got fired. We all got kind of cut or released and they brought in yeah. Romeo Cornell and it was a different team, different staff the next year. Um, I was there with Bruce Arians was our offensive coordinator and Todd Bowles wow. and Chuck Pagano. And we had a great staff. Um, Butch Davis was probably the weak link on the staff, to be honest with you. We had Bruce Arians was amazing. And, yeah. uh, and of course, Keith Butler, the line, the defense coordinator for the Steelers was our linebacker coach, Todd Bowles, who was with the Jets, you know, he's now with Tampa uh, Pagano, who was a, who was an awesome guy too, a defensive back guy, was a head coach for the Colts. I mean, we just, we were loaded, man. Uh, and yeah. Cleveland just has a hard time getting free agents and always has. And so very yeah. difficult to win there. But the last time they went to the playoffs was 2002 when we were there. Uh, yeah. I was a backup there for three years, got cut. And then uh, Lane Kiffin was with the Raiders um, in 2007 and signed me there. And that was the year they drafted Jamarcus Russell. And I was there for okay. like six months. And then I got released and I haven't been in football since. So, yeah. So just hearing these coaches you had exposure to, just what an embarrassment of riches in terms of men that are good leaders and good life coaches and people. I mean, you've had so much exposure to some incredible people. So that's so fortunate for you to be able to carry that on. So in at this point now, you know, you are probably what, close to 30, late 20s, 30. You're for football age, you're sort of aging yeah. out as a quarterback. <laughs> so it makes sense. So the hardest thing for a lot of athletes is what do I do now? You know, I've been an athlete. I've been totally focused. I've been in the zone since I've been 10 years old or younger. And it's all I've known. It's all I've done. And you know, it sounded like you had some good guidance by your parents and your coaching to, to look out, look at the bigger picture, look at networking, look at all the people you know, because the rest of your life is going to be based on those connections. So tell me a little bit about life after sports uh, and, you know, what that transition was like for you and, you know, and then starting your life as an entrepreneur to get back to that. Hey, it wasn't easy. I mean, I think everybody that gets out of sports a lot earlier than they hope for or that they dreamed about, you know, playing till they're 40 or whatever. I mean, but I think the the average NFL career is two two years or 2.1 yeah. or 2.2 years. I mean, it just doesn't last that long for most guys, especially like running backs and, you know, in different yeah, positions. So beat up. Quarterbacks can last a little longer. But um, I, I – so I, I went back to Southern California and started working with my agent – with the agency, uh, Athletes First, which was – uh, with Dave Dunn, who was formerly with Steinberg, and I helped them for a year recruit quarterbacks, and we recruited some really good ones. Aaron Rodgers was one um, yeah. that we got there. Um, I, I signed like five quarterbacks, Kyle Orton, Derek Anderson, uh, Orlowski, uh, Brock Berlin, a kid from Miami from my high school. Uh, anyways, we so I did that. Cedric Benson, the late Cedric Benson, signed him. Uh, so we had some success there doing that, but I wanted to play the whole time. So every time I'd go in there – in meetings they'd ask me how the recruiting was going and I was I was flying around recruiting these kids but I'm like I want to play I don't want to recruit you know and so I would I just push them and I think I pushed them too much where you know we got into it one day and I told Dave I said get me a dang job playing in the NFL I mean this is crazy I'm, I thought I was better than all the guys I was recruiting and recruiting. of course Aaron Rodgers is a hall of famer but I felt like I could play you know so I'm like I just wanted to play and it was very tough adjusting. So, you know, you were asking yeah. about how hard is it? I mean, it's really hard when you're coming out of it and trying to get into business and stay relevant at the same time and make some money and build a business. I mean, there's just so yeah. much to think about. And then I, so I, I went up to LA and, and got a media agent, uh, headline media actually out of New York, but they have offices in LA and I'm, and uh, I, I started working for Fox and ESPN, ESPN radio did a, show with Chris Myers on the weekends up yeah. Fox Fox Sports Radio in LA. 
I started doing that and got into the radio stuff or, or TV stuff as much as I could. Um, you know, I did pros versus Joe's. I did all kinds of stuff yeah. back in the day. And he was on, even on some TV shows, um, you know, on soap operas. I mean, I, it was funny. I was just trying to do whatever I could just all. Going in LA and uh, seeing what would pop. And then, and then uh, I got a call from a, a buddy of mine in Louisiana about uh, putting the healthcare deal together and, and doing some biz development for them and, and having ownership in the company. So I flew down to Baton Rouge, met with the guys and, I'm like, I, it sounds good. I mean, they, they, you know, they, they were talking my language. We were going to make a bunch of money and put a business together. And yeah. so I did that. I, I ended up selling out of that like three year, two years later and got into a different business. And then it kind of just snowballed into all kinds of different things, but it was a hard adjustment in the beginning. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of people that didn't play at that level from the outside looking in can't understand why it's so traumatic and so challenging for athletes but you know that people don't realize that your mindset and your passion and everything for so many years is so focused on competing at a high level that's all you can think about for and when it's over it's oh it's boom it's over even yeah. if you felt that you were still in your prime you still were thinking, well, I still want to play. I still have a handful of years left. So you got that going. Then you got, what is this business world I have to do? You know, and you're, you're doing the business, you're doing the sports business. So you're exposed to your old life and you're really seeing it. And you're going, wait a minute, I'm not ready to give it up. And it's just so challenging on every level. And you've been making all this pro money, big league money. And now you're getting into the business world where you're not making money unless you start building a business, which takes yep. years and time. And you're used to having income coming in. It's a complete earthquake in someone's <laughs> life. Uh, is, but, you yeah. know, look, you've done so much now as an entrepreneur uh, and as a, you know, through your sports career. I'd love to hear, are there any lessons you've learned or are there things that you would look back now, knowing what you know now, would you have done something differently? Uh, you know, if there's young guys coming out of pro ball, uh, you know, that are thinking about what do I do with my life? Do, would you have advice for them? I mean, I let you take this anywhere you want. I, mean, I just yeah. would love to hear your take on all that. I think one of the things I was thinking about when you're talking was, um, was that, you know, to, to, to be, you know, I would, if to be more well-rounded is, is so significant because a lot of kids, like you say, they put all their eggs in one basket. It doesn't work out. There's an injury. They get homesick. There's all kinds of things. There's, I talk, I tell this story all the time in the minor leagues. There's a lot of players that you could yeah. take that never made the big leagues that you could go take and play Derek Jeter and a rod and all these guys that made, they're going to make the hall of fame or we're all stars. And half the time they could beat that their butt, you know what I'm saying? Because yeah, one reason or another, they just didn't make it. Maybe they were homesick. Yeah. Maybe they got their girlfriend, missed their girlfriend or got someone pregnant or they got into drinking or drugs or alcohol or, or maybe they had to go home and work because their parents got laid off. I mean, there's just right. all kind of reasons that these guys don't make it. And you have to work up the ladder too. And it, it's time, you know, it, it takes a lot of a good timing and, and it's time consuming. I mean, there's just all kind of reasons. So I'm, you know, I guess that's the first thing I think about is like, there's a lot of guys that never made it that are better or just as good as the guys that did make it. And they have to go home and start working and, and, and provide for their family and do their own thing. And I think the best thing for a young person would be, you're not, you're not guaranteed pro sports, right? You can go at it, but it's still, you still got to be on good teams. It's you're only as good as the people around you in football. I mean, you got to pick and choose wisely where you go to school. Um, just so much that goes into it, but the more well-rounded you can be. And, and I wasn't a big time student and I wish I was a better student, but all I did was focus on sports, but I, there's a lot of guys that focused on education too. And I think they're way better for it because it disciplines you when you go home and study and, or when you go to class and you do the right thing, it's like, you're going to do the right thing later in life too. It's just, you're, you're teaching yourself uh, sure. principles on how to, uh, really, I guess, you know, manage every situation, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and apply yourself and, and read, you know, read, I wish I would have read a lot more younger, but I was so involved in two sports. I didn't have time to think or breathe. And when you're the quarterback right. of a major sports you know, university, you know, you, you barely have time, you know, it's like, you're like the governor right. of 
state, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know. I, I just, I would tell people young age, you're not guaranteed pro sports, go at it with all your might, but also, you know, develop some other skills, get well-rounded and you can still practice just as hard as everybody else or, or practice even harder than other people. You just have to apply yourself in the downtime and at night and different things like that and do things, choose things uh, that will help you become a better person and not just uh, have fun, you know, outside of sports. That's fantastic advice. You know, it's just pure wisdom, pure, you know, timeless values. And, you know, that makes, you know, it sounds so simple, but it, it, it's the difference in everything. And uh, I, I love that you shared that. I, I just think that that is when I hear successful people talk about things. I love hearing that, you know, the, thinking back to their younger days and being more being more disciplined, even with stuff like school, it's like giving you reps and it's giving you building your brain muscles and your endurance yeah. for doing whatever you're going to do in life. And I love that. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that. So let me get into a couple fun things before we wrap up. Um, uh, one, how did your John, how did your brother, John David Booty, get to USC? Thank God he did. Fight on. I'm an SC <laughs> alum. How did a Louisiana boy not follow in the footsteps of his brothers? So what's yeah. the what was the story? Maybe I got to get him on the podcast and, and get his story of what that was like. But what is what was the quick answer of how he ended up at USC versus staying well, going yeah, to Alabama I, or LSU? Yeah, I was living in Southern California, and then my family ah, loved out, right. and he loved visiting. So um, Norm Chow, who was the offensive coordinator at the time, yes. had recruited me, my brother, my high school. Uh, knew yeah. my dad well. Uh, they threw the football. LSU yes. didn't throw it quite like SC. Carson Palmer had just won the Heisman. There's just a lot going in, in a good direction yeah. there. And Pete Carroll is just an amazing coach, and we knew that. And we knew he'd coach pro. We knew he was he was the man. And so JDs went out there and fell in love with Pete Carroll and Norm totally. Chow. And, and Carson had just left. And, you know, he liked the guys like Leinert and Brandon Hans and – uh, Matt Castle and uh, yep. Michael McDonald, the guys that were in the locker room, he just loved those guys. He's like, man, this is where I want to be. He just felt like it was yeah. home, you know, and he always, he didn't want to really play at LSU. He wanted to do something different. Um, and he it was always going to be Miami, I think, or, or USC. And uh, USC was the hottest at the time. Yeah, makes makes complete sense hearing that. It's not, there's a lot to love. What's not to love about that? Especially if you're a quarterback going into that offense with all the <laughs> quarterbacks there and the Norm Chow and Pete Carroll. Totally. Another fun thing I got to bring up. A uh, couple years ago, uh, you got back into baseball for a quick second on a TV show with my boy Millar, Doug Flutie, uh, a couple other people. Tell me about that. You you went on the show, The Knuckler, Millar. It was Millar and someone else. Uh, who hosted? Who was the other person? Malar hosted it. Yeah, Malar hosted it with Tim Wakefield. Wakefield, and, the um, knuckler, of course. <laughs> Wakefield, the knuckleball. So they were just te they wanted to teach former quarterbacks how to throw a knuckleball yeah. in a reality uh, yeah. competition show, like a Big Break on the Golf Channel. And I said I would do it, and I was really the only guy that had really played professional baseball that was competing yeah. in the deal. David Green, yeah. Ryan Perlou, Ludi. Um, JD, my brother, came and yeah. and uh, ended up winning the competition show right. or whatever, which was actually fairly easy, to be honest with you, because <laughs> I was the only baseball player. <laughs> you know what but I was saying? It was a fun concept. They got these sick, sick athletes to just go learn how to do something so unusual. Throwing a knuckleball is unbelievable. one of the just strangest, uh -huh. rarest thing that anyone does in sports. So let's get these just phenom athletes, freak athletes to figure out this weird sport niche. <laughs> you win the thing. So were you like in training to do that or do you just show up and screw around? You're like, all right, I'm going now. Well, I'm going I did. We, we had like a month before we went to Dodger Town, old Vero Beach, uh, old Dodger Spring Training Ground. That's yeah. where we filmed the show, and that was like a nine- or ten-day deal. But um, I had like a month, but, uh, <laughs> a month. you know, my arm was always in shape because I trained kids and my my nephews and stuff like that throwing. And so I, I was like – my arm was in decent shape, but I'm like, these guys' arm aren't, aren't going to be in shape either. And so I just went out and threw long toss for like a month, and then I fiddled with it. Got and, it. you know, as I played pro baseball, when you're out shagging and doing all that your whole life growing up, we used to throw the knuckleball. So yeah, I, I knew how to around. throw it. You know, I knew how to throw it a little bit. 
And those guys probably had never thrown it. And so right. that was a big advantage that I had been around baseball and actually had tried to throw it, a, you know, a bunch, just shagging balls in the outfield growing up. And, and so I kind of knew what I was doing when no one else did. So that's why it was a big advantage for me, but it was, it was a fun show. Flutie was actually really, really good throwing the knuckleball. He just, He's such an his arm strength. Yeah. His arm strength, because if he was 10 years older than me, his arm strength was not there. Um, so he was throwing the thing, you know, 58 miles an hour when I was throwing 68, you know, and that's a lot of difference with a knuckleball because how it can move and cut, you know, so, and he was yeah. throwing at 75 miles an hour, I was throwing at 89, you know, fastball. Yeah. So just yeah. a lot of difference, you know. Yeah. So you ended up, they ended up part of the show is your winner. You get to go to spring training or something. So you got yeah, to go to so, spring training and so mess around. The Diamondbacks, they had set it up, I guess, with the Diamondbacks that, um, they would bring, they would let whoever won the show gets to go to spring training uh, with the Diamondbacks. And so I won the show and, and I talked to the Diamond, I t- talked to Kirk Gibson and all those guys and, and they're like, Hey, you're coming in. So I'm like, I go to big league camp and I, it was crazy. I got to pitch against the giants three times in spring training games. Wow. It so was you were the in most- game time situations. It was real. It well, we I faced the Giants and they just won the World Series. Bruce Bochy and all them. And I'm throwing yeah. I'm throwing a knuckleball, you know, sixty something miles an hour up here. And these guys are real hitters. I mean, real hitters. Yeah. And uh so that was it was kind of nerve wracking in the beginning. But, but I had fun with it and you know they it, it's funny kinda of how I kinda of ended. I didn't give up any extra base hits. I did strike out like five and three innings. I was I was getting them. But nice. I was getting them. They wanted to send me to like, uh, you know, Double A Mobile and to throw it. And I was like, man, I'm just not going to go ride the the, the buses around uh, the you, southern. You had it. Yeah. I just, I was not going to do that. <laughs> and then I talked to Wakefield. They released me. I talked to Wakefield. I went I went down to Tampa and worked out with Gary Sheffield because he's got a he's got uh, this this uh, baseball school down there. So I would be, throw, I was throwing knuckles to Gary and he was hit, you know, and we were, I was doing all this stuff. I was at USA baseball in Houston, pitching against Berkman yeah. and Adam Dunn. I mean, I was, I was wow. really trying to stay in it. And uh, Wakefield was trying to get me signed by the Red Sox. Um, and uh, they had Stephen Wright coming up from triple a and he was a knuckleballer. And like, we're not going to have two knuckleballers in one team, yeah. you know, so yeah. it, it never really happened. And then I, yeah. I got a call from the Astros uh, not too long after Bo Porter was down there as the manager. This was before AJ was there. And uh, anyways, he, he got fired. And so he did, he wasn't able to bring me in, but I, I kind of <laughs> thought I might get a chance for yeah. the big leagues, you know? Yeah. This yeah. was just how, a couple of years ago, right? It was like four years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's so four years ago. You was my pick to the big 40, league. That's 41 throw, year old knuckleballer. Throwing a knuckler. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's unbelievable. So, Anything else you want to you want to wrap up with? Anything you want to share? Give you this opportunity, but it's been awesome catching up and hanging out with you. Man, I uh, I was I was pretty happy with the World Series. I mean, it was fun. Go I Dodgers! Talking, I was talking to your you know Millar the whole time. He's a huge Dodger fan, and and uh, he just loves baseball so much. So it's fun yeah. to, to to hear him talk baseball and how passionate he is and yeah. so it's been a fun it's fun a week or so you know just watching the world series and kind of feeling like you're kind of close to baseball again i guess because everybody was watching that series with covid and everybody staying home but yeah. um you know just just uh having fun i've got uh i've got twin boys that are playing high school football they're freshmen and they're superstar oh kids One's a quarterback, one's a receiver. So I'm I'm awesome. involved in that. My nephew Abram's son is playing quarterback at Allen High School. They're like number 19 in the country in the polls. Unbelievable! So, I, mean, I the love next watching generation of booties. Yeah, <laughs> baby. <laughs> where where are the boys? Where are your boys playing? They're in Shreveport, Louisiana. They're going to my high school. Yep. They oh go my god! Me. So they're they're the same high school. Is your dad still involved? My dad is retired, but uh, the guy that started the school with my dad is the head coach and. And uh, so he's, he's coaching them just like he coached me. So it's 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 crazy. So there you go. You have four more years of Friday Night Lights in uh, Louisiana. That is so awesome, man. Well, look, you got a, a lot of things going on. I wish all success to your your ventures and business. Thanks Thank for you. coming on and sharing everything, man. I hope to see you and Millard soon. We'll uh, have some beers awesome. and make some make some jokes. I wouldn't mind coming out to Shearport and watching some Friday Night Lights. So you know, you send me a to. schedule. You need to. 
you need that would to be incredible. I, I appreciate you having me on the show and it's always fun to catch up brother awesome thank man you. be good i'll see you soon booty thanks man thanks buddy. great I know job dude. i love him too <laughs> thank you fight on fight on, fight on right, baby. see you soon man <laughs> dun, 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 dun. yeah there you go there you go <laughs> i love it Hey, guys, thank you for joining us. I appreciate Josh Booty spending some time breaking it down, telling us about the Shreveport, Shreveport, Louisiana days, talking about the NFL, MLB. You can always find us at Instagram, at The Deal Pod, or at Danny Brown LA, my personal. Uh, You can find our website, thedealpod.com. Please follow. Please subscribe on our YouTube channel or any of our podcast channels. We appreciate the support. We've got more fun episodes coming up. Go Dodgers, baby. Go Dodgers. The Dodgers just won it last night. Fantastic. My boys are going bananas. I'm sure you guys are all having fun with that, too. So, anyway, catch up with you guys soon. We appreciate it. See ya.